The island of Cuba is 90 miles south of Florida. It's the biggest island in the West Indies and in the Greater Antilles. It is the heart. It is uh, where my abuelo, my father's father, came from. It was the economic heart of the Caribbean. It had the swankiest casinos and hotels in the 1950s in the Western world. It grew incredible cigar tobacco. In 1959, around New Year's Day, a former Cuban baseball player who had spent time in the United States, Fidel Castro, who later went to Moscow to become a communist agent, led a, a takeover, a revolution, against Fulicino Batista, the dictator of, or president of Cuba. Now, Batista had been corrupt, and Castro was this young guy with big black beard, bigger and curlier than mine, and he had these sort of photogenic revolutionaries around him, uh, like Che Guevara, who was not Cuban, and whose face adorns the t-shirts of every wannabe rebel on American campuses. You've known, you've seen the face. Sort of this bearded, intense guy with a, with a beret on. Uh, che murdered people. Uh, he killed homosexuals. He killed people for listening to rock and roll and playing it. Che was no... Uh, rebel in the in the bohemian or hippie sense of the word, but because he looks like one, he's like a Hollywood picture of rebels, rebeldom. Uh, he is still to this day an icon of the far left on universities. I, whenever I think of Che, I'm thankful to the Bolivian army, Ejercito de Bolivia, Viva, because they killed that sob, ended him because he, after Cuba, went to Bolivia to try to stir up revolution. Didn't work. Poor guy. Anyway, uh, Cuba very quickly went into a communist orbit. One reason for this was a plan uh, using Cuban exiles by the CIA that had been planned by the Eisenhower administration was launched by the new Kennedy administration in 1961, a landing of Cuban exiles at the Bay of Pigs in Cuba. The plan was that the Cuban exiles would land on the coast, capture a radio station, say we're the legitimate government of Cuba, come help us, and American military forces right offshore would come in. The problem was that Castro had infiltrated these exile groups. Uh, the communist spy service worked very well, and there were tanks waiting on the beach, and they were slaughtered. We looked like idiots imperialistic idiots to boot. Castro then says, I'm a communist. And he establishes formal alliance with Khrushchev and the Soviet Union. Well, in 1962, American spy planes spot missile installations being completed on the island of Cuba. Missile installations for medium-range nuclear weapons. Up until now, the Soviet would have to go through Europe or launch an attack over the North Pole by bombers or maybe long, long, long-range missiles, but that would be a dicey thing to try to hit the continental United States with atomic weapons. But with a missile base 90 miles from Miami, the East Coast could be flattened within 15 minutes, which is not really enough time to react. President Kennedy is faced with a choice. We could ignore it, which would be suicide, or we could uh, invade Cuba, or we could do something else. Kennedy orders an executive committee formed of the best and the brightest minds that he had to come up with a third answer. One answer proposed by General Curtis LeMay of the Air Force was airstrikes to flatten the missile installations and other military installations of Cuba to be followed up, if necessary, by an invasion by the Army and Marines. The other option advocated by Kennedy's younger brother, Robert Kennedy, the Attorney General, nepotism, was um, a 
quarantine, a naval blockade of Cuba. Nothing gets in, nothing gets out by sea. These missiles are being shipped in by sea. The U.S. Navy will block anything from coming to Cuba, and the blockade will remain until the Soviets uh, withdraw the missiles. Everyone who I have ever met who lived through that month remembers what they, where they were when John Kennedy came onto the American television screens and told the world about the Cuban Missile Crisis. Most of my family were in New York City, which would have been a prime target. We really thought that we were about to go toe-to-toe -to -toe in a hot war, a nuclear war, with the Soviets. From October 16th until October 28th, the world is on the brink of full-scale war. A back channel arranged by the British was the only contact between American and Soviet diplomats. And in that black channel, the Soviets say, well, what we want is we want a, a symbolic removal of American Jupiter missiles from Turkey, which was a NATO member. If you remove American Jupiter missiles from Turkey, we will remove our missiles from Cuba. The Americans say, no, we are not going to have that kind of quid pro quo at the beginning. You have upped the ante by adding nuclear weapons to our enemy in the Western Hemisphere. This is not something we're prepared to accept. Meantime, the Russian ships and the American ships are getting closer to one another. An American U-2 plane is shot down over Cuba by a Soviet missile. It looks like the war is going to go hot unless something happens. Khrushchev in the middle of the night, sends a telegram to Kennedy saying, what can we do to bring peace? The next day, he sends another telegram to Kennedy saying, you will not intimidate us. And it's clear that the first telegram is from the heart, and the second telegram is from the Politburo, Khrushchev and his allies, who are ready to go to war. Kennedy's executive committee chooses to respond to the first and, not, and ignore the second telegram. And from that, the Soviets agree to withdraw their missiles. Khrushchev blinks. We win. Quietly a year later, Jupiter missiles are removed from Turkey. So in fact, a deal had been done. But the Russians were given a bloody nose, propaganda-wise, for having uh, intruded their atomic weapons into the Western Hemisphere. The deal that we agree to is the Russians won't put strategic nuclear weapons uh, in Cuba, and in return we won't invade Cuba. Here's something that's come out after the end of the Cold War. Apparently, and I can't understand why in the world they would do this, the Russians gave a few of these missile silos, these missile bases, into the hands of the Cuban military. The Cubans, not the Russians, would have made a decision about whether or not to launch an atomic attack. The Cubans, not the Russians, could have launched World War III. And the Cuban communists I'm talking about, no one at the time imagined the Russians would be reckless enough to give Cubans, who would never have been able to develop atomic weapons on their own, the ability to command whether or not they are going to be launched against the continental United States. What this means is, had the invasion of Cuba happened, or even had the airstrikes occurred, it's incredibly likely that a Cuban missile commander would have launched and destroyed an American city. And had that happened, we would have escalated and life on Earth would have ended in October of 1962. We were this close. That horrific event scares the bejesus out of everyone. And after that, the Cold War changes. Khrushchev is replaced. He was sort of a brinksman. He was somebody who liked making people flinch. He used to bang his shoe at the United Nations, famously saying, we will bury you. We, communism, will bury you, capitalism. Well, he's 
replaced by a, uh, a more plotting uh, apparatchik uh, communist bureaucrat named Leonid Brezhnev. Brezhnev is not so bold. Uh, at the same time, the hotline is set up, a red phone in the Kremlin, uh, the, the, the headquarters of the communists who rule the Soviet Union, and a red phone in the White House, a direct line of communication, secure and backed up, so that at no time will the president of the United States and the premier of the Soviet Union be out of contact. And this is designed to prevent a war up to the last minute. Uh, a comprehensive nuclear test ban treaty is agreed to, uh, which uh, is supposed to eliminate open-air testing of nuclear weapons, atomic weapons. Uh, and both sides basically come to terms with the fact that instead of trying to win the Cold War, it's about holding your ground and maybe fighting around the edges in limited ways. But we do not want to go that close to a full-scale atomic exchange again. One of these limited exchanges is in former French Indochina, which we'll talk about next time.